The first year or two, the hardest part was not quitting. At first, the amount of hours you put in and how underpaid you are if you're actually working it out per hour is probably like more than anybody is willing to do. At the onset, I said I'm going to commit. And that first year was rough because I was just wearing myself into the ground. I was not seeing any dollar signs whatsoever. And then in the third year, the traction by God's grace really, really kicked in. This is what I say to people all the time. If you can't sit there and say, my idea is worth giving my time to unconditionally for a short period of time, it may not be a very good idea if you're not willing to do that. My name is Lisa, mother of eight and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today I am having on Grace from the Shepherdess podcast. She shares a really inspiring message that I think in this homestead farming type of world, a lot of us want to get some acreage and make a living off of our farm. I've heard it said so many times by so many different people, but when it comes down to it, whenever we actually work the numbers, we're disillusioned into thinking that it's not actually possible to make money farming. And I know that I've thrown that around too. Like whenever you have chickens, the eggs are just cheaper at the store, the milk's just cheaper at the store. But she shares an alternative perspective on how she has turned her farm business into a six-figure farm business in three years. This is coming from no prior farm experience. She's leasing the land. She didn't grow up being a farmer. She's not married, has a husband doing all of this work. And I think that the way that she approaches it very practically from a marketing perspective is really smart that a lot of us, you know, we just want to have the farm and we want it to earn an income, but not really sure how that translates. So let's dive into this interview with Grace from The Shepherdess. We actually chatted afterwards, and this happens so many times with so many of my guests where afterwards we just have a conversation and it's like, oh, that should have been the whole podcast. <laughs> oh man, so many times I'm like, why did I, why did I turn off the record? Um, because then we start, you know, talking about certain things, but she's a really great wealth of knowledge to follow along with. If you are interested in farming and it not just costing money, but actually making you money. So let's dive in. Well, thank you so much, Grace, for joining me. I listened to your podcast on, or your YouTube, whichever, where people listen, but you're building a $100,000 farm business in three years. I listened to it again today to like refresh my memory because I got the idea for this episode a while ago, and I found that episode very, very inspiring. Kind of busts the myth that you can't make money farming. And I've heard you talk about this a couple times with Joel Salatin on your podcast as well, which I found very interesting and entertaining. So we're going to talk about that. Let's start with introductions. Tell us about you and your your business, your farm. Yeah, absolutely. So my farm is in Northeast Texas. We are on about 30 acres, and we moved here in 2017, we kind of did the pre-COVID exit of suburbia, Okay, um, but we wanted a little more space to roam. And shortly after arriving here, we bought a small flock of sheep. Where I come in is in 2020. I had no farming background, no desire to farm at all. I came from a background in business and marketing, and that was my primary occupation. And I'd still say it is my primary occupation, mm -hmm. but I did see in 2020 the number one, the need for more people to become engaged with the land and more active in agriculture, even if it's in a small way. I saw the need to provide for my family in some small way, if not immediately, just building into a future source of food for the family. And I jumped in with both feet, but the business side of me also saw the profitability factor in grass-based low input agriculture and penciled out really, really well with sheep. So I jumped in in 2020 with a little bit of a diversified desire to make an income from agriculture. And that's kind of the starting point. Yeah, that's what's so interesting to me is you came at this not really with farming experience, but with arguably something more important, and that would be how to market and work the numbers before diving too far into it. And one of the things I found interesting is your first step was cattle, I believe. 
And then you quickly switch to sheep because of how fast they, you know, you could feed them out. Or I don't even know exactly what the whole reason is for that, but we can go more into that. So how long was it that you just stuck with cattle? I pretty quickly ditched the cattle thing. And that was, and that is probably one of the most important pieces of advice I can give to people you just touched on is starting backwards in a sense. If you have a goal, mm -hmm. put it on paper. If it pencils out well on paper, you've got a good chance of it happening in real life. But if you make an absolute mess of it on paper and you can't make it work on paper, more than likely in real life, it's going to be a mess. So I did all of the numbers. I With cattle, it came out to my business plan with grass-fed beef was about $8,000 gross I could do. And then- For the year? For the year. For <laughs> the assuming. year. Yeah. And that, yeah. that may have been okay. net. I'm sorry. That may have been net. But grass-fed beef on 30 acres. And then I penciled it out with my sheep. And it was something like $32,000 with just the sheep versus cattle. And that's what we were looking at. And so I said, okay, that's enough of a margin to say, even if I only do twice as much with sheep than I do with beef, it's worth it to uh, to give it a go there. Yeah. And you have a diversified sheep business. It's not just, you're not just selling meat. You're also, what all are you selling? Yeah. So when I jumped into it, it was just pretty exclusively sheep. And what I did when I started was I began to sort of build an audience around sheep. All I had at the start was just to sell sheep. But as I began to build that audience, they had different needs. They had different wants. And I just began to listen really closely. And because I had started a newsletter, which is something I tell people just straight out of the sheep, please mm -hmm. start a newsletter. Even if you don't see yourself going anywhere, just start a newsletter because you never know where it's going to go. Um, but I started a newsletter right up front and began to accumulate subscribers. And those subscribers started asking me for different things beyond sheep. So I had my first livestock sale, just for example, of how this worked in my first year. I had my first livestock sale and I sold about $1,500 um, worth of sheep. Well, I sold about two times that in the secondary products, supplies for sheep, books on how to graze sheep, um, education for sheep and so on. So just, it was a matter of building that audience and then listening really closely to them. Yeah. One thing on your podcast you were talking about was the first maybe year or two, the hardest part was not quitting because you put in so many hours before actually seeing any profit. And I haven't started a farm, like for profit farm, we have a dairy cow and ch chickens and all that, but like we don't farm for our living, but I have started other businesses and that is definitely really good advice because at first, the amount of hours you put in just and, and, and how underpaid you are if you're actually working it out per hour is probably like more than anybody is willing to do. So, yeah, Absolutely. can you talk a little bit about that, like how the hardest part was just not quitting? Absolutely. Yeah. So when I first started out, I said to myself, I actually part of the business plan. And if anybody wants to walk through this business plan, I'd go in depth about it on my website. But part of the business plan was giving it a timeline and saying at the onset, I said, I am going to commit insofar as I'm able seven years to this before I counted a success or a failure or anything in between. And so at the onset, I said, I'm going to commit. And that first year was rough because I was just wearing myself into the ground. I was not seeing any dollar signs whatsoever, except for the outgoing, you know, dollar signs, yeah. of course. Um, the second year, I began to see a little momentum, but still I was subsidizing, subsidizing, subsidizing. And then in the third year, it just, the traction by God's grace really, really kicked in. And I would say this, this is what I say to people all of the time. If your idea you can't sit there and say, my idea is worth giving my time to unconditionally for a short period of time. It may not be a very good idea if you're not willing to do that. Um, and that's a bit of a litmus test mentally to say, is there a deeper reason as to why I am doing this? Do I feel more deeply connected to this cause than just for money? And then practically speaking, you do have to put a dollar amount to it. And you do have to say, do I have the finances to sit down and carry this through to the end. I always think about that. I think it's a it's a verse from the Bible that talks about if any of you sitting down beforehand doesn't just count the cost to see whether mm -hmm. he has the ability to finish this out, you know, you just you've got to do that. And so those are just some really serious things you need to do at the onset. Yeah, and some practical things like putting it down and thinking, do I have the finances? Do I can I actually commit the time that this might take and being realistic with all of that? 
And then you said something on your podcast about how there are easier ways to more quickly turn a profit. So it's important to make sure that there's more to it than just that. Although I will say three years with the success that you've had, obviously in no way was it easy, but even knowing it's possible, I think yeah. is very inspiring for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Yeah. So in those first couple years, it wasn't just building out the infrastructure of your farm that took your time. I know whenever you were talking through the whole business plan thing, it was a lot of the online marketing. So you utilized Google, which is, I think is really smart. I think a lot of people don't really think of that. And your newsletter. So what did the time spent? You said you spent so many hours. What did the time spent look like? What did that look like in the first couple of years? So in the first couple of years, it looked about like two or three hours. I'd say two hours a day on pasture and two hours a day sitting at the desk, whether it was writing blog posts for that Google search engine optimization or mm -hmm. setting up a newsletter and thinking of ways to encourage people towards that newsletter. I talk a little bit about incentivizing your newsletter and making sure you are really focused on giving. There's a principle that if you just focus on giving to people and genuinely, genuinely serving them with good information, the they're going to reciprocate. I mean, when it's time and you have some, an opportunity to sell them on something, they're going to trust you more readily. So in that first year, it was two hours on pasture and two hours at my desk. Primarily, I was building out my newsletter and my blog because like you mentioned, Google is really overlooked a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity to continue to blog. I mean, blogging is not what it used to be, but it's by no means dead. Oh, no, it's not dead. It's actually like our biggest income source. So I always think it's funny when people mm -hmm. overlook blogging and Google and search traffic, because I'm here to tell you, my blog has done nothing but grow the last eight years as I've continued to put more and more time. And I'm so glad I never gave up on it because people have said that it's dead. And you talked mm -hmm. about how you didn't focus on your YouTube numbers and your Instagram numbers. Right. That is a huge trap that I think business owners fall oh, into. Yes. Absolutely. And this is an interesting thing. I just put out a video um, just to reiterate that. But yes, pay attention to your newsletter metrics above all else. If your newsletter subscribership is growing and healthy, and that that is that is the heartbeat of a healthy business. For example, I had a video that went out and I think it accrued like a hundred thousand views. And the conversion to newsletter on that was like two hundred. 200 newsletter subscribers. And on the flip side, I had another video that was very focused on converting to a resource that was tied to my newsletter. And it has driven something like 5,000, 5,000 newsletter subscribers with the same amount of views. And so just focusing really heavily on driving whatever traffic that you have back to a platform that you own. I mean, the algorithms are constantly shifting and things are so unsteady on, on third party platforms. But if you can build your newsletter, it's going to be a really powerful tool for you. I know. I think as business owners in today's world, we get so focused on the metrics everybody can see because I don't know very many people who would say, I have 100,000 mm -hmm. on my newsletter. They'd rather say, I have 100,000 on my Instagram. That just holds a lot more prestige for those who aren't in the know about it, it sure looks a lot more impressive. But uh, on the on the flip side of that, if the goal is to build a sustainable business, which you've done with your farm, then every one of those newsletter subscribers is so much more valuable than a quick mm -hmm. follow on Instagram. Yeah, I try to preach this all the time. <laughs> and one of the things that really encouraged me was that metric that I heard, and it was it's really proven to be true for me, but for every one newsletter subscriber that you have, on your list, you can expect a dollar of income per newsletter subscriber on your list per month. So if you have 500 newsletter subscribers and you're working that newsletter appropriately, you can mm -hmm. be looking at $500 of extra income per month. That's been a really true stat for me. And that's really been one of the reasons that growing my newsletter has been the focus. Yeah. And that's, that's built this sustainable business for you. So what are some of the ways practically that you were able to build your newsletter? Like what you said, giving away your best resources, what kind of resources have you done with your newsletter subscribers? Yeah. So at the onset, when I very first started 
building my YouTube channel, I was learning. And so I was showing people how I was learning. And a lot of the um, resources that I offered were worksheets tied to how to raise sheep, number one. And but probably more popular were the worksheets tied to how to make a business plan out of your farm, out of your small acreage farm. The most popular resource that I have is the $100,000 farm business plan. That's yeah. the <laughs> business plan that I sat down three years ago and I penciled out for myself. And three years later, sort of showed through that second video how it came to fruition. So those kinds of educational pieces were the most valuable at the onset. Yeah. And figuring out, like you mentioned, what you're, what they're asking for and then giving it to them. I I've also had the mindset throughout building my business of giving away all my best stuff for free. And I've seen, there's more than one way to do it. I've seen people who put everything behind a paywall and they are making a living, but I've definitely done, mm-hmm. especially if you're just starting and you know, you're brand new to this, giving away your best stuff. It, it's really worked well for me. And I've, I've, like I said, I've heard business experts kind of say the opposite, but I've always done that too. And, or at least I definitely did for the first five years. And yeah, you build an audience of people who they feel like they they're getting value from you and they're not having to pay for it. You know, maybe there's some ads on the videos and whatnot, but yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. The relationships are everything. And, uh, you know, if you think about building a relationship within a family, it's the same as building a good relationship within a business. You give, give, give. And it's like raising that two-year-old child. You know, you give, give, give to that child and they hit an age where they can start to give back. But in the same way, when you're building um, a business, there is going to be a season where you're just giving, giving, giving until that relationship or that child, I guess, is grown in a sense. Yeah, definitely. All right, taking a quick break from this episode to tell you about my brand new course, Simple Sourdough. This one has been a long time coming. I have shared about sourdough over on my blog and my YouTube channel forever, but I finally compiled all of the information that you need to be successful with sourdough, uh, the starter, making your first ever loaves of bread, using the discard, so many things in my course, Simple Sourdough. You can find it at bit.ly slash farmhouse sourdough course. That's all one word, bit.ly by slash farmhouse sourdough course. The coolest thing about the new simple sourdough course is that there's a corresponding private Facebook group that is for students only. I'm really excited that that'll be a place where when you have specific questions, there'll be other students in there, sourdough enthusiasts, and we can all learn from each other. This is usually such a valuable asset because a lot of times you'll have a specific question that you don't want to filter back through the course for. It's all there, but sometimes you just want other people who are on the same journey as you. And I'm really excited to provide that course, which just the lifetime membership comes with the purchase of the simple sourdough course. Again, you can find that at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse sourdough course. So what is the minimum amount of acreage? I know people probably ask you this all the time that you've seen someone able to make a profitable living from their farm. Cause this is something like everybody wants to do. Like, honestly, as you know, everybody wants to buy a little or not everybody, but, but most people in this in this demographic here who are listening to this podcast, at least I hear it all the time, buy a farm and live off the farm. And there is this, like when I hear someone say that, and then they start telling me like the way they're going to do it, I'm instantly like, nope, 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 that's not going to work. But you figured out a way to make it work with something niche like sheep. But yeah, what's the acreage required for that? It is more a matter of mindset than acreage. I mean, there are business models where people are making twenty and $40,000 a year off of an acre of microgreens. I think the biggest deal that we need to overcome, the mindset hurdle that we need to overcome is just adaptability, being adaptable and taking our resources, number one, knowing there is a way to monetize it and make a business off of it, whether it's a hundred square foot or one acre. Um, but you need to find a market. So for example, that one acre where they're making 20 or $40,000 off of microgreens, you need to find a sales outlet for those products and understand that it's going to take a little more sweat equity if you have less of a land base or less of um, a resource base. But 
the more and more I'm researching and individually profiling farms that are just doing it on an acre or an acre and a half, I'm realizing it's more a matter of mindset than uh, materials. So are you able to tell me a few, like, okay, sheep obviously has been more profitable than beef in your experience, maybe Mm -hmm. in your market, there's probably lots of profitable ways to do beef, but are there like certain niche niches that, oh yeah, that, that tends to always kind of work or is it based more on the person's market and mindset and how they're marketing it? Yeah. Yeah. So you need to, this is one of the most important pieces of advice somebody gave to me was just to think backwards. And when I coach people through making business plans, the second step on the business plan is finding your market, finding where you're going to sell and who you're going to sell to. And I guess to take it to a personal level, this is what it looked like for me. My market research, when I initially had this desire to do beef was I went for one hour radius and looked at the farmer's markets in my area and realized, okay, They're very saturated with beef, but there's only one or two lamb sellers around here. You know, my competition base is much lower. And what I also noticed was that that lamb was selling sometimes 50 or 75% over what that beef was selling for. So it may be a little bit of a hurdle to get past at first, but if you are going in this for profit, think backwards, find a market, find a customer group, find a group of people that you are going to sell your products to and watch what they're buying already. And think of how you can make it better or think of how you can make it more unique or palatable. As far as something that is just general guidelines, obviously sheep pound for pound are more productive on a land base than cattle. I mean, you have a gestation period of five months versus nine months. You have a weaning and slaughter date four months after that lamb is born versus 18 or 24 months after that lamb is born. So the cash flow on a smaller animal is crazy. I've heard of people getting into things like rabbits and Mm -hmm. doing rabbits and, and for sale on a small acreage. And again, the cash flow on rabbits is even faster than sheep. So just think in those ways in the context of the size of your land base. Yeah. One thing I always think of, but I haven't actually penciled in the numbers, which is what you actually have to do, not just go on a hunch. But it seems to me that raw dairy is, at least in my area, Mm -hmm. what it sells for. I'm like, man, Mm -hmm. this calf that I started thinking about it, whenever you have a calf that you're calf sharing, if you can sell milk for $15 a gallon, which you can here, then the calf is costing like, I think I figured like 45 or 60 bucks a day <laughs> to raise. I'm like, how does this work? Or am I just not thinking of this quite right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're speaking in terms of it being more profitable to actually sell the milk than raise the calf yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it seems like it just based on what I've seen people selling it for around here and then thinking the calf is drinking Yes. Three, four gallons a day. Grass-based dairy (laughs) is actually more profitable than the pasture poultry movement stuff. You've got your format. You've got your customers. I mean, it is the tops. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. That's how it seems to me. You were talking through the six things that you did. And I don't know if this is the same thing as your business plan. Maybe it's not. These are just your six things you did to set yourself up for success. What did it look Mm -hmm. like to lay out your goals and how... Like, how do you make your goals achievable, but yet something that you're going to stretch to try to reach for? So number one was setting income goals. I wanted to work this on a side hustle basis and keep my main job and needed, honestly, that cash flow and main source of income. So I wanted to earn $30,000 spending two to four hours worth of work per day on this business. Um, That was number one. I, number two, found a product that fit that and a market that would purchase that much product. So I knew that through newsletter, social media, or local markets, I could more than likely have a really good chance of moving that amount of product that I needed to meet those sales goals. And then once I did those preliminary work, set out all the numbers, I launched the newsletter. I built my newsletter. I established my blog, and then I chose one of three social media platforms. We've got Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You really need to find one and and work it if you're going to go internet-based. I focused on YouTube right up front to start building my internet newsletter. And I just 
it was it was time and consistency. It was I said when I chose YouTube, I said I'm gonna commit to 50 videos before I quit. I was chugging mm. out those videos. I was chugging out those videos. One a week and, for a year. You know, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. 50 views, 50 views. Well then, boom, 40, video number 48, 49. It's something, something tripped, something tripped. Was it the and Joel Salatin the ones? Views, the Z- Joel Salatin ones were up front oh, okay. and they were slow. Okay. They were slow. But I think what the YouTube algorithm was looking for, they were trying to figure out what you were doing, you know, finding yeah. a niche for you. And so just as long, I, I stayed really consistent and really focused with the kind of content I made within those 50 videos. Um, but that's really kind of what happened. It tripped about a year in and started to really gain some momentum. Yeah. One thing you said was that the hardest money to make in any business is your first $1,000. And I really do find that to be true. Do you think it's because at that point your mind opens to, oh, this really is possible. I actually believe this. Or what's the reason behind it? I don't know the reason technically behind it, but it is, I think you could use the analogy of like breaking ground on a house. That's what your first $1,000 is. And I found that earning your first $1,000 in a business Earning $30,000 wasn't a whole lot more work. Those mm-hmm. same processes went in in that same amount of time. It was just a matter of snowballing and momentum. Um, so I think just for people out there, you might just get to the end of year number one or year number two, and you're like, man, I made like 900 bucks this year. Just understand that consistency and, and realize the, the snowball effect, really, mm-hmm. and, and latch hold on that. Yeah, that is definitely true. For me too, it just, whenever I made, I always say my first 500 because that was kind of what I made like first was with a certain thing I did. It made me realize, well, if I just did more of the same, then I can just, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) exponentially grow this. Yeah. And it it made me realize that it would be possible to do it. And so I I definitely have heard that too. And I think that the $1,000 thing, it kind of validates, it gives validity to your idea. Mm-hmm. And then you can step back and say, how hard was it to earn this $1,000? Am I willing to put this much more work in to earn $30,000 a year? If the answer is yes or no, if it's yes, move forward. If it's no, that's way too much work even for $30,000. It does give you the opportunity at that point in time to kind of step back and say, rework things. Right. Right. Yes. I like the idea of validating the concept. So I'm going to ask you some specific like sheep questions that people were curious about. But first, what is, what does it look like right now for you? What is your daily farm work, your computer work? Do you have any hired help? What is a day look like? Okay. Yes. So I wake up usually around seven o'clock. I'm not a super early riser, but I'll wake up at seven o'clock and I'll try to be on pasture working by eight. And I will work from about 8 to 10 a.m. and wipe out all of my pasture outdoor work. I will set inside from 10 a.m. to about 4 p.m. and work the internet marketing, the blogging, the video production. At the present, I have a small team that will help me with spillover video work. Um, But primarily, I am producing the videos you see on YouTube. They'll just handle kind of the overflow. And then I will have someone come in and help me package the orders from shepherdist.com, which is the sheep supplies that I sell. That is the extent of my team at the moment. And then I will do a few more pasture chores after work between work and dinner and the evenings I try to take off. Okay. Yeah. So the pasture work, a lot of that is rotating and I don't even know what all goes into raising sheep. Yeah. So... Yeah, rotational grazing is a huge, huge part of my farm and really the low cost element of my farm. And so that is what the morning chores consist of is just the grazing management, moving my animals daily. Right now, I do have a pen of lambs that I have to tend to. They are freshly weaned and require just a little bit more care. And so that's all kind of wrapped up in that early morning stuff. Cool. And then during the day, you're writing blog posts, you're filming videos, editing videos, uploading. Yeah, there's there's plenty of work to be done in those hours. I understand that for sure. Also, right. And there are secondary products that I sell as well with the sheep supplies and the sheep books. So I'm sourcing educational materials that are going to help people. I'm creating lists of products that I use and that, you know, again, people want those resources on. And so that's kind of all wrapped up into it. Um, Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I love that you didn't actually have any farm experience 
this was just something that have you always wanted to have a farm or was it more just like you saw the opportunity? Well, then you also said just sustainability wise, like securing food and whatnot. But yeah, that's interesting that you dove into farming. Yeah. No, I had no background in farming and no desire to farm whatsoever. It's a really odd thing. It's just something I can say that the Lord put me right in the middle of where I'm at right now. Um, But I think it's also a testimony to the fact that there is so much education and opportunity to learn very quickly out there. I think Mm -hmm. we're at the best time um, for anyone who has a desire to farm or to learn a skill. The information age we are in right now is unbelievable. The ability to learn things, implement them in a very, very short amount of time. It took generations to accrue the amount Mm -hmm. of education we have at our fingertips right now. And so I think that should really encourage people going into this who may have some intimidation. Oh, I don't have multi-generational experience. Um, There's a lot of, there are a lot of mentors on the internet right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so true. Sometimes we get really negative about where we are today because we feel distracted and there's always temptation to be on your phone. But whenever you can flip that and realize, yeah, if back in the day to come up with this amount of information to be able to start your own profitable sheep farm completely from scratch with nobody in your life knowing how to do this or you growing up that way, that is, you know, to be able to have that opportunity is just like to do literally anything that you want to do is unprecedented. And so, yeah, I think it's good to flip that. And I think you hit on something really good in one of your recent posts, and it hits on the fact that you will have to sacrifice some things. You will have to flip from being a content consumer at some point in time to a content producer. I mean, you've got to get off your phone and you've got yeah. to do it at some point in time, even if it's just small. And I think that's one of the um, one of the big deals that it's simple, but it's important to latch on to. You may not feel all of the confidence that you need to move forward in it, but just take a small step in implementation of what you've learned. Yeah. And I think it's helpful too, to know that even content creators who appear very successful still have self-doubt. There are times whenever I go to record something and I'm like, I've already done this a million times or, you know, all of these things. And I come on and you think I'm just confidently moving about my day and you know, this is what I'm doing and I've never thought twice about it. But in reality, all those same things go through my head. Like, do they really want to see me make this bread again? You know, and you just kind of keep doing it, even if you feel like self-doubt sometimes. And you do have to, at some point, take the information and, and try it. You can't just keep consuming the information. Yeah. On the marketing side of it, the flip side, there is this rule of sevens that people have to come in contact with the concept seven different times before they'll take Mm -hmm. action on it. And I think we take for granted that people see something once and they got it. Right. Whereas they really need to be repeatedly exposed to the same idea again and again before they'll take action. Whether it's me selling a product for sheep or a sheep itself, I need to create seven points of contact for that concept um, before I can expect the customer to really pull through. Yeah. That's that's totally true. I noticed that as a consumer of content that a lot of my favorite creators talk about and show the same things over and over again. And that's what gives me the confidence to be like, right. nope, I can I can continue to show the same stuff. Like it seems like all the successful people I follow do just talk about the same things over and over again. And you've really niched down into sheep. And obviously you found that to be the case, too. I want to take a quick break to tell you about my favorite makeup, and that is Tubes & Co. So Tubes & Co. is an organic, natural skincare line made by a small company, U.S., made in the U.S., based in the U.S., that the, the products are not just natural and organic, but they're also really great. I've found that to be a major hole in the marketplace over the last several years. I wanted to wear natural makeup, but I also wanted to have my face look like it was wearing makeup after more than about 15 minutes. I've even tried making my own makeup and a lot of that was just very insufficient. So I have my Tubes & Co makeup. My favorite product is definitely the foundation. I have referred this to so many people in my real life. Everybody loves it. Just the other day, my sister, my youngest sister, tried it for the first time and she was like, wow, I cannot believe the Tubes & Co makeup. It is officially my favorite makeup. So that's been the reaction from basically everybody I've referred it to. 
I love their mascara. I just started using the natural eye makeup palette. Absolutely love it. My favorite thing is, well, other than the foundation, is the eyebrow pencil. Love that thing. Also a huge fan of all of their skincare. So their cleansers, their serums, always makes my face feel so great, especially as we're getting into some of the colder months and the wood stove's going and everything's all dry. I will apply the serums all throughout the day and use the cleansing oil at night to really cleanse my skin and moisturize it at the same time. Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off your order with the code FARMHOUSE over at Tubes, that's T-O-U-P-S and co.com. Tubesandco.com, use the code FARMHOUSE. Okay. So we got a few audience questions on sheep specifically, and we've kind of touched on various business ideas that you could work backwards and create a profitable business on a small farm. But some people want to know just about sheep. So what natural medicine do you use on your sheep? That's a very quick and specific question. Natural medicine. So I will use apple cider vinegar. It's very, very hot here. And that's what I'll use to increase water consumption over summer in their troughs. I've also been using honey. Hydration is a big, big deal in the summertime because that's usually when I weaned my lambs off and worked with them there and they need an incentive to drink extra water because you're getting really hot. Um, but that's about the end of the natural remedies and natural treatments for my sheep on the farm. Cool. So how noisy are sheep at night? This person is concerned about their neighbors. If they're anything like goats, then they're loud. But I don't they, know. they are only noisy when they are hungry. So usually when my sheep, okay. when I'm a little bit late to feed my lambs, maybe um, they're extremely noisy. But the sheep on pasture, I mean, it's probably the quietest and most peaceful thing just to be out there when they're eating their grass. So they're not noisy. Don't be worried about that. I have heard people say that there is just one sheep that won't stop making noise. Some have gotten rid of sheep that are like okay. that. So it's more maybe a personality um, than an actual overall broad spectrum issue with sheep. And then probably too, with the goats, the reason that they were allowed for us is we milked them. And so we separated the kids at night. So probably if you're doing yes. like a sheep dairy, that would be different. It would. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what is the best breed to start out with for meat, for milking, both? What are the breeds? Okay. So for meat, I would highly recommend a hair sheep. And those just will be a low input because they do not require shearing. Top three hair sheep available at the moment would be the Dorper sheep, the Katahdin sheep, and the St. Croix. If you're going into this on a homestead basis, I would recommend a Katahdin or a Katahdin Dorper hybrid or a St. Croix Dorper hybrid. The Dorper's a little bit more high maintenance and it's worth it for me personally because I do get a very good price off of my breeding stock. People will do what I'm advising you to do and that they'll bring in a Dorper ram to increase the carcass size or rather the meat yield on a flock of Katahdin ewes. But on a homestead basis, try to get a good cross that's gonna provide you with a low maintenance meat sheep. For the dairy end of it, all of your dairy sheep are going to be wool sheep. So you're gonna to have to maintain that. But the dairy sheep, East Frisian is a really big dairy sheep breed. Um, the Lacan, I just interviewed someone last night. She has a cross between, it's a Finn sheep, an East Frisian and a Lacan. And then there's also the Awasi, which is a little bit less available, I believe in the States. And those are the dairy sheep breeds. Okay. I wonder what dairy or what the milk sells for. Are you familiar with any like dairy? I'm sure you are sheep dairy farmers, or I'm sure it varies throughout the country. The ones that I have interviewed so far are not selling their milk yet. And it's going to be a really interesting thing because sheep dairy is very much up and coming, yeah. but it's very much new in that you're going to have to really do a lot of consumer education. Now, I don't think it's going to be very hard because apparently sheep milk is just the most incredible product, mm -hmm. but it is going to take some consumer education for those flipping into a for-profit situation. But like you said, it's up and coming. I've already heard it just in passing from so many different influencers and farm, you know, whatever. I've been seeing it around to the point where I'm like, oh, I think I need some sheep milk. And so it, it's obviously something that there's a little bit of a buzz about right now. And so I don't think Absolutely. that the education is going to be super difficult. Mm -mm. No. And that's the neat thing about sheep is that the, the milk especially has 
a ton of advantages over even goat's milk. I think there's an element called lactoferrin, which is supposed to be like this miracle food. It's It has super, super high amounts where other milks don't. So I'm excited. I'm kind of thinking and dabbling in the dairy side. Primarily I'm in meat right now, but it's kind of an interesting frontier. I'm excited about it. Yeah. And I bet, I bet it'll go for a lot. I mean, raw goat milk goes for way more than raw cow milk. And so if sheep mm-hmm. milk is... I don't know. Like, does it have the taste like goat milk? The goats that we milked, it tasted like cow's milk. Every once in a while, it got a goat taste to it. But I don't know. Like with sheep, is is it just sweet and delicious and creamy? That's what I've been told. It's just not even comparable to goat's milk. It kind of has that sweet and mild flavor. So hmm. it's weird that the goats took off so much. Like we all know about goat milk, but sheep milk somehow knew. Right. But yet the animals, like if I had a neighbor mm-hmm. that drove by our property and saw it, I bet you they would just think it they were goats because they look so similar, mm-hmm. you know? Right. right. Okay. So what about fencing, food, shelter, maintenance? How hard is it to get started? Are they like goats in that you need, like cattle are super easy to keep in, but goats, they're not. So how are sheep? Mm-hmm. Sheep are probably midway. And I know because I have both sheep and goats, I cannot contain my goats in electric fencing right now. Um, but the sheep... If you've got a good charge on that fence, they'll stay in, currently staying in on two strands. As far as you want, your biggest investment will be in a perimeter fence. On small acreage, I would advise that you do invest in a good perimeter fence for the sheep and the goats. The housing, I would have a small shed that you can bring them back to in case of snow, but I've seen a ton of economical ways to assemble those. So again, it's very low input at the start. And as far as care and facilities, again, you do not need expensive facilities up front. You can use that shed that you'll house them in for protection. You can use that to care for them. Just make sure that pen you, that you can have have a small tight space to really work your sheep in. And you can do that with just a piece of hog panel, make that pen a little bit smaller. And that's about the end of what you need to get started with sheep. So you can keep the sheep in on two, you say two strands of electric wire? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do have a good perimeter fencing and that's what I'll harp on is just to make sure you have that insurance. Like Um, four by four? Right, right. Six by six is what I have. And once you have that perimeter fencing, a good electric fencing will allow you to rotate them around whatever farm property you have. Yeah, yeah. And if you can do that yourself, you could, depending on the acreage, get into it fairly cheap. Have you tried the netting? We tried the netting with the goats and our property is too hilly. And so Mm -hmm. we never could get it to not touch the ground. Right. Right. The netting is excellent. And if you're not quite at the place where you can afford the perimeter fencing, get about four sets of netting and give it a go. And um, that is really, really suitable for sheep. I have not yet had my sheep escape from a well-charged electric netting. Okay. Okay. So for your business specifically, people were wondering, how did you actually start? Did you have money saved up, loans, investors, or how were you able to start it, you know, from nothing? Yeah. So I am on leased land. So I'm leasing the land. I did not buy the land. I started with an initial investment of about $11,000 and that purchased the fencing and the sheep flock that I needed to get started. The beauty of sheep is that they will reproduce really, really fast. So, you know, within about a year, your flock size is tripled through lambing. So I was able to buy that small flock to start and install the fencing. And those were the biggest expenses. And now I mentioned keeping my day job. There were additional expenses like setting up the rotational grazing and so forth and then paying the land lease but those were the two biggest expenses and that $11,000 initial investment was what I needed to fence 30 acres and buy about 25 good quality sheep. Yeah that's lower than I would expect you know that's something that you could feasibly save up for or yeah that's awesome. Yeah it was important to me to do that without the debt because it was a risk. I mean, I said to myself when I kissed that $11,000 goodbye, mm-hmm. I said, there's a chance I could never see this again. And I've got to be okay with that. And just a matter of realistic, a realism, you sort of kind of have to do that when you're taking risks and starting a new business or a new venture. Yeah, I, I agree. And I've always been of willing course. to do that with businesses. I, whatever, I actually educate people on how to start blogs and how to start YouTube channels. And there are a lot of people who you know, they don't want there to be any costs associated with the hosting. And unfortunately, there just is there with any business. I mean, this is definitely a lower cost business to start, but there's always 
going to be, you know, some costs associated with starting a business. And I like the idea that you were, you know, this, we'll see how this works. You did your due diligence in penciling right. in the numbers and making sure at least is possible to work. You know, you're not fighting a losing battle there, but yeah. risk. There is going to no risk, no reward. I mean, you're going to come and mm-hmm. hit a place where you do have to make some scary decisions. Yeah, definitely. All right. Tell us about your podcast and what you share over on the shepherdess and is your podcast, your podcast and your YouTube is the same, correct? Mm-hmm. Or is there additional? Yeah, they're pretty closely okay. tied. Um, a lot of the videos I will just part down to audio for the podcast and I'll do longer form on the okay. podcast. But the YouTube channel started out as just a chronicle of my journey from day one. I was starting out as somebody with no experience and I was looking for other people. Am I crazy or are there other people doing this? Well, I couldn't necessarily find a whole lot of people who were sharing what it looked like to build a farm from the ground up, at least from a experience perspective. So that's the way it started. And I have about 150 videos that really do chronicle from day one. So you can pretty much start watching the first video and see how things have come, even down to the thought processes. Why did I choose sheep over cows? Why are sheep 400% more profitable than cows for me? Those kinds of content. And then I will, we had a huge learning curve as first time sheep owners. So I put up red flags. I want you guys to have all of the opportunities to see the ugly side of it that I did in watching it firsthand for two years before jumping and committing. So I do share some of the primary challenges you're gonna face as a beginner sheep farmer and also how to mitigate those, you know, know about them ahead of time. And what have we used to really mitigate those issues and uh, bring them under control for a profitable situation? That's awesome. I think people will love to go follow along there because for so many, it seems like just a dream to start a farm and actually make money from it. You were saying on your podcast that the median income, is it farms in general that you were saying is actually negative something? Negative $661. Now, to be fair, I mean, good businesses do report losses to avoid taxes. Well, but, yes, but still, you can only but, do that to an extent. At some right. point, you can't do that anymore. I know. And, and the median income of a zookeeper is, like 40, is listed as like $40,000. And on that converse side, the farmer is negative $661. So you, you're coming, we're coming up against a time where the need for people to be engaged in agriculture is so needful, but you've we've got to diversify and we've got to do it differently. Uh, And that's what I appreciate so much about your podcast. And then also the interviews you've done with Joel Salatin, because that's his mission as well is teaching people how to do this profitably because clearly we're having an issue there. Clearly we, we struggle to figure that out. And I've even been one to say, you know, yeah, get the chickens, but it's, it's not like, you know, you would definitely get cheaper eggs or get the cow, but the milk would definitely be cheaper. And and the way that, you know, we've done it because this isn't our primary business in a lot of ways, that's true, but it's so nice to know and encouraging to know, listening to you and Joel Salatin, that that is not how it has to be. You actually can make money. And I've, I actually know some farms that are also doing what you're doing and they've creatively figured out how to actually turn a profit and not be the statistic where the median income is negative. And so it's encouraging for people to know that it's truly possible. Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Grace, for joining us. Make sure to go check out The Shepherdess over on all the podcast platforms on YouTube. Are you The Shepherdess over on Instagram as well? Mm-hmm. If they input that, they'll see it'll be Harmony Farms Dorpers as the handle, but they can search The Shepherdess. Okay, gotcha. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast, and I will see you in the next one. Mm-hmm.